Hopefully it won't be too bad. <laughs> so, I mean, really, it's just great to see so many of you in the room. Um, and also, it's good to know that the wider audience is watching us live online. So technically speaking, this could be the biggest ever audience for a Radio Centre research launch. So a very well, warm welcome to all of you. And I hope you feel that by the time we conclude that this has been time well spent. But without further ado, this morning we're going to be sharing um, some initial headlines from our latest research project, Big Audio Data Mine, which, as important to say, is still a work in progress to some extent. So we'll also be giving you a flavour of what lies in store in the near future with the next phase of analysis. So, see if my clicker works. Oh. I don't think the clicker's working. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. Oh, yes, we have to lift off. Okay, so I'm sure that many of you are familiar with at least some of the research projects that Radio Centre's done and they're shown on the screen here. Traditionally, these take a top-down approach, setting up precisely defined fieldwork to explore how radio advertising works in a specific context and or how it influences previously unresearched measures of success. The project that we're launching today, however, takes a very different approach, and it shines a light on a relatively unsung hero of the Radio Centre research portfolio, which is Radio Gauge. Okay, so many of you may have some experience of Radio Gauge uh, based on campaigns that you've been personally involved in. But for those of you that haven't, and as a bit of a refresher for those that have, I'm going to ex briefly explain what it is and what it measures. Basically, it's a Media Week silver award-winning radio advertising effectiveness measurement tool, which is funded entirely by the commercial radio industry. We launched it almost 14 years ago, with the goal of helping a wide range of individual advertisers to understand the specific effects that they achieve as a result of their advertising campaigns and how they can be enhanced through creative development informed by best practice creative learning. Okay, so this study achieves this by comparing the post-campaign differences in a standardised set of incomes and they include things like ad awareness, brand relevance and purchase consideration between matched samples of commercial radio listeners and non-listeners. Respondents also score each ad against 11 statements linking to Radio Centre's bespoke Five Eyes um, radio creative evaluation process. And those Five Eyes are involvement, identity, impression, information and integration. The research is conducted at regular intervals across the year and it uses a consistent methodology and sample to measure all campaigns. Beyond economies of scale, crucially, um, that also means that all data collected from each and every campaign is directly comparable. And as we launched it back in sorry, 2008, um, since then, over 1,000 campaigns have been measured by research agency DRG using this standardised approach. And so for some of the UK's and the world's biggest advertisers, small selection of whom are shown on this slide and represent a wide range of product sectors. So we know from speaking to advertisers and agencies that the individual campaign level results it provides are highly valuable in advancing their confidence in and certainly understanding of the effectiveness of their radio activity. But in addition to building advertiser confidence in the medium, over the years, Radio Gauge has also been quietly building something else. All of the information collected from the fieldwork for each individual campaign has since launch been collated and stored in the Radio Sensor database which also records basic media campaign planning information together with the main creative attributes of every commercial measured based on a standardised set of 22 coding rules developed by the Radio Gauge team at launch. And over the years, that's developed into a deep data source, combining radio campaign planning factors, creative um, impact, um, creative attributes and effectiveness outcomes. 
to the best of our knowledge, this is the biggest and most comprehensive radio advertising data set in the world. So, having reached the landmark of measuring over 1,000 campaigns earlier this year, the time felt right to conduct an in-depth meta-analysis of this hugely rich bottom-up data with two specific objectives. First of all, to provide a state of the nation overview of how Hold on a second. <laughs> of how advertisers that have been measured on Radio Gauge over the last 13 years have been used in radio and the headline effectiveness outcomes that they've achieved. And also having done that, to develop understanding of which creative and media campaign planning factors are most influential in optimising results. So... We appointed um, data analysis company Colortex to run this project um, and it was an added bonus that the founder of Colortex, Jason Brownlee, who we've got the pleasure of having with us today, had also worked on the initial launch of Radio Gauge in 2008 and he continues to oversee Radio Gauge projects in other markets around the world. So therefore he was completely au okay fait with the service and the data to crews. The analysis process uh, um, that was adopted by Colortext involved three main elements. So first of all, data cleaning and alignment, and if any of you have ever been involved in this type of project knows, it's a crucial stage of any big data project to ensure the data is accurate, comparable, and as complete as possible. I don't want to tell you that this took about three months of toing and froing coordination between Colortext and ourselves. Uh, with the assistance as well with Robin Angel from JET, who I believe is also here today, to just help fill in some gaps in media campaign planning information. And with everyone checking and double checking, in my sleep, can I add, before adding, moving on to the next stage. Um, which, thank God, was a straightforward summary of the data to provide us with a state of the nation overview of radio advertising usage and effectiveness across all campaigns measured in the study. Once that was complete, we were able to press on with the final stage of the project using a combination of quartile analysis and regression analysis to identify the creative and media planning characteristics which are most associated with best performing campaigns and the extent to which they influence outcomes. So at this stage, I'm just going to remind you, as this, work, this project is a work in progress, that regression analysis is still ongoing, but we do have some interesting initial outputs to share with you today. Okay, so before we move on to reveal the findings we've unearthed so briefly, Oh, sorry, so far. <laughs> Let's briefly review the final data set that emerged from the data cleaning and alignment process to inform this big audio data mine. As you can see on this slide, our big audio data set consists of a total of 1,002 campaigns for 463 brands across 14 sectors involving 100 different media and creative agencies along the way. The data set then features information relating to seven radio campaign factors, um, with each ad coded on the basis of 22 creative attributes. Hopefully you got all this. All of this data is then linked to five different outcomes, uh, from ad awareness through to brand metrics and finally response. And in combination of all those elements, what we saw was a total of 500,598 uh, data points for analysis. Thank God we hired someone to look at that. So, this chart shows the number of campaigns which were included in each sector, and as you can see, there are really robust numbers for each of them. For those who are familiar with top um, spending advertisers on radio, you won't be surprised by the sectors at the top of this chart which feature the most case studies. So now we know the data we've been working for, so let's move on to the next set of outputs resulting from the data summary. Okay, and to remind you, this stage of the analysis was designed to provide a state of the nation overview of radio advertising usage and effectiveness across all campaigns measured in the study. So obviously in the interest of time today, we're just gonna focus um, on the uplift rate, and that is the relative uplift in campaign performance metrics among commercial radio listeners when we compare those to the matched sample of non-listeners. 
and then averaged across all campaigns. So we'll be looking at this for each of the effectiveness measures that are detailed. Again, ad awareness, brand relevance, brand trust, and brand consideration. The exception here is claimed response, um, which is based purely on those who recall hearing the radio advertising. So let's have a look at what we found. Starting with ad awareness, this chart shows the aforementioned uplift rate averaged across all campaigns for which we have information in the data set. So you can see that number highlighted in white at the bottom. And this is for all people who answered yes to the question, have you seen or heard any advertising for XYZ brand, whichever we were measuring in the last four weeks. And as this chart shows, levels of ad awareness are almost 50% higher among commercial radio listeners when you compare that to the match sample of non-listeners. I think it's fair to say over the years, radio's ability to reach out to wide audiences and drive awareness has generally been acknowledged among advertisers of all sizes. It's also true to say that ad awareness is generally the measure that is most responsive to advertising activity. But how does radio perform against more challenging to shift brand related metrics? Okay, so this chart, which now includes the average uplift rate among commercial radio listeners compared to non listeners for uh, those respondents who scored eight to 10 um, on an agreement scale for the statement, this brand is for people like me. And it demonstrates how radio advertising also has a strong uplift effect on how people feel about a brand. In this instance, brand relevance is on average 24% higher amongst people exposed to the radio campaign compared to those that weren't. And that reflects how radio listeners often perceive themselves to be part of a wider audience of people who are just like them. And it's true whether the station output predominantly serves a local geographic community or a wider community of interest. Okay, so this sense of audience community has another important um, effect beyond just building brand relevance. So back in 2002, the Henley Centre observed that the fact that they often feel part of a wider community is one of the reasons why listeners put a high level of trust in what they hear, and that's very powerful for the advertiser. We can clearly see the benefit for advertisers. Oh, I'm hitting the microphone there. <laughs> so we can see the benefit for advertisers um, in this chart, which now features the uplift rate for respondents who strongly agree that this is a brand I trust. On average, brand trust is among almost a third higher amongst commercial radio listeners, and it also reflects historical analysis of the IPA data bank, um, which shows how advertising campaigns that feature radio generate significantly higher levels of brand trust than those who don't. So, in the context of the Advertising Association's recent research um, revealing a general decline in consumer trust in advertising, this data reveals that radio's audience communities offer advertisers a unique opportunity to bolster trust in the brand. So now, so far, the data has shown us how radio can drive awareness and change the way people feel about the brand. But what can it reveal about how people actually behave as a result? Okay, so added to the chart is the average uplift rate against measured um, campaigns uh, for those respondents who are highly likely to consider buying the advertised brand. And that highlights the, how radio's ability to drive ad awareness, brand relevance, and brand trust also translates into an 18% average uplift in purchase consideration. If we put all of these uplifts into perspective, Nielsen analysis highlights how in a typical year, Radio's share of total media spend amongst those advertisers that use the medium is around 8%. So that clearly demonstrates how efficiently radio works as a part of a wider media mix. So driving uplifts are between 18 to 50%, depending on the measure, with only 8% of the budget. And that's why radio is often referred to as the multiplier medium. Okay, the final measure of behaviour resulting from exposure to radio advertising that we have data for is response. This chart shows the average proportion of respondents across 291 campaigns for which we have information in the set who claim to have searched online for details or visited the brand's website as a result of hearing the radio, um, or sorry, the radio ad. So these figures of 21% and 19% are based only on those who recalled the radio ad, so we don't have a comparative measure for non-listeners. 
These numbers equate to a response rate of between 4 and 5% based on a total base of commercial radio listeners exposed to the campaign. A response rate which, I'm sure, um, most direct response advertisers will actually be, del be delighted to achieve. Okay. So, so far, we've only looked at averages across the total number of campaigns in the database, but as with any study of this nature, there are significant differences affect across the campaigns, which we've illustrated on this chart, which features the average uplift rate in ad awareness by sector. It's also true to say that there were some similarly significant ranges in uplift rate between campaigns within each sector. Okay, which leads us neatly on to the final stage of the process using a combination of quartile analysis and regression analysis to identify the characteristics which are most associated with better performing campaigns and the extent to which they influence them. So as we stated up front, this project is still a work in progress, particularly at this stage, but we do have some interesting outputs from the initial analysis to share with you today. Okay, at an overall level, our analysis revealed that there are many factors that can influence radio campaign performance, and we have broken them down into the fixed and variable factors which are shown on this slide. Fixed factors are completely out of the advertiser's control, such as the sector the brand occupies, the size of the brand, and its purchase cycle. By variable factors, we mean ones that the advertiser can influence, such as radio campaign planning weights and creative execution, and it's these that we're actually going to focus on today. So let's start by reviewing what we've learned about the impact of radio creative execution on campaign performance. This chart is showing that the top 10 creative attributes based on the difference in average ad awareness uplift rate for campaigns with commercials that feature each of the individual creative attributes shown compared to those that don't feature them. As you can see, Eight of the top ten relate to the developing consistent audio elements, such as music, voices, strap lines, brand characters, sonic device, and using them um, consistently within different radio executions and across media where relevant. So this learning is not really a surprise to know the importance of these, um, as it's consistent with previous radio, radio sensor reviews of effective creativity, which we featured in our multiply studies over the years. So having considered creative best practice, let's move on to radio campaign planning factors. And for this analysis, Colortech sorted all campaigns into quartiles based on their deployment of the different campaign planning factors and sorted from highest to lowest. So average uplift rates in ad awareness were calculated across the top two quartiles. That is, those that used higher levels of reach, frequency and ratings, and then compared to the average uplift rate of the bottom two quartiles, so those running at lower levels of reach, frequency and ratings. So this chart is showing the average uplift between the top and bottom two quartiles for each campaign planning factor. So taking weekly reach, for example, the average uplift factor um, was 15.7% higher in the top two higher reach quartiles than in the bottom two lower reach quartiles. And reviewing this data, what's interesting is that for a medium that has become synonymous with frequency planning over the years, reach is clearly the driving force behind better campaign performance. Again, we shouldn't be surprised by that outcome because it strongly echoes learnings from the return on investment multiplier study. And simply put, the more people you reach, the bigger your campaign effects will be. So that brings you up to date with what we've learned so far from this part of the analysis. But I've said it many times, there's more to come. Um, and the best practice learning we've developed is yet to move on to the final stage of quantifying the level of influence of each factor in isolation. That's where we're heading next, with a view to develop more nuance to the data we've already extracted and provide advertisers with a clearer picture to the extent of which different combinations of fixed and variable factors can be tailored to deliver optimum effectiveness from individual radio advertising campaigns. So that brings us to the end of the findings that our big audio data set has produced so far. And before we leave you, 
there's a quick summary of the main headlines that I'd like you to take away. So, first of all, radio consistently delivers significant uplifts for advertisers across a wide range of effectiveness outcomes, from building awareness and positive brand sentiment through to purchase consideration and online response. And that's true for brands operating in all sectors, irrespective of whether radio is used um, as lead medium or as part of a much wider media mix. The additional impact that radio delivers for advertisers in relation to its share of total media spend demonstrates how it can also enhance efficiency of media plans, and it reinforces why it's become known as the multiplier effect. Oh, had to unzip the tongue there. <laughs> Secondly, the best practice learning delivered to date provides um, advertisers with clear guidance on how to optimise these effects through developing a consistent audio approach for their brand and by planning to maximise campaign reach. Reassuringly, these headlines reflect key learnings in Byron Sharp's theory of how brands grow, target all category buyers and use brand assets consistently across media and over time to enhance brand salience. So that just leaves me to clarify next steps. As we've already mentioned, we'll be conducting further regression analysis and assuming this is successful. We also plan to develop a radio campaign planning optimization tool, and we're going to launch this alongside the new analysis early next year. So until then, I hope that's given you enough of a flavor of big audio data mine. So thank you very much. And we'll be around for questions later.